this is a new poem titled Oh No, I Still Haven't Found My Sparkle. Imagine waking up in the belly of a dinosaur. The thought has kept me busy in, on hot days in Leicester, but how would I know? I don't even live there and I've never been. I've never met Boo Radley either, but I still like to think of him as my dad. I've begun believing in ghosts. I tell them they can haunt me the best of them. Sometimes I haunt myself. I reread the messages I sent from my deathbed, a digital Ouija. I've never felt so connected to somebody so disconnected, but science is excellent. When I write in first person, I dream of dying. When I write in third person, I dream of long walks, 500 meters below sea level. I'd argue green is the best color, though unfortunately for green, yellow exists. I keep thinking we left the door open, but there isn't one, we're outside again. I'm just dreaming of dying, one year on from the last time I saw you cry. Hello, how lovely to meet you. I wonder if I may ask you a few questions for just another third YouTube channel. Of course. Thank you. Um, so, the first question is, uh, can you remember the very first time you felt an urge to write? I wrote a lot as a kid, but it was all short stories about playing for Chelsea Football Club. Um, <laughs> always, Rude Harlett would pick me to play alongside him and we'd score the winning goal. Um, and then when I went into my GCSE years, I was always, my strength lied in writing and in English. Um, but I, can't, I, was, I was good at poetry, but I had no interest in it. And then my teachers kept picking up that I was good at it, but still had no interest in it. And then when I was 16, I was on a trip to Austria and a girl I liked showed me her boyfriend wrote him a poem, wrote her a poem. And I was, she was really smitten by it. So I thought, I'm gonna write a poem. I'm gonna try and write a poem for her. So I wrote a poem that I just mimicked uh, 10 things I hate about you. I hate the way you do this, I hate the way you do that. And um, I gave it to her and she gave it to her boyfriend who edited it and sent it back with suggestions on how to improve it. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> and then I just I just kept writing from there. So I guess that is a natural start for many, many teenage boys really. Uh, and he's starting with like a, a love poem or it's a romantic ditty or something like that. Yeah, I would think so because I think especially growing up very working class, you don't, you're never led to believe that you can, you can write or do art or any form of art really as a career or as a, even as a hobby, it wasn't something I thought was possible. I was always kind of, you know, your, your work is in the trades. Um, and it, the art wasn't something that was on the table. So art becomes this sort of like side hustle that you kind of do and then fall in love with and experiment with as you get older. And that's when I started to realize this is, there's something here, yeah. I broke my arms in a race against broken sleep with which you end your poem, Ice Skating, Garden of Eden, 1998. Please could you tell me about Broken Sleeps and how Broken Sleep books started out? Sure, so I have insomnia. I've had it the majority of my life. Um, as a young child, I had night terrors that never went away. The night terrors never stopped. So I um, never really learned to sleep fully. And when the night terrors stopped, about 30, I was about 30 years old, so about two years ago, the insomnia never went away. Um, so Broken Sleep has always been something. And when I started Broken Sleep, we, Emma and I had just had our daughter, Rue, and she was terrible at sleeping. So there's two forms of broken sleep, me being unable to sleep, and then when I could, Rue would wake up and cry. And there's the J.H. Prynne poem, uh, Smaller Than the Radius of the Planet, which has the line, I lay out my own rest like white lines on the slope so that something out of broken sleep may land there which is why we've got lay out your own rest at the back of all of our books, because it's our motto and it's got broken sleep from that. So it was kind of an amalgamation of those things. And I'd previously had a small publishing press called I Came Here Looking For A Fight, which is a line from a song by the band The Wonder Years. And it was all just like typeset and word, printed in an office printer, you know, in cardboard and printer paper. And it never really took off. 
but I enjoyed that act of making things and when I had free access to Adobe InDesign when I was a media studies lecturer I started practicing using it and getting used to that in Photoshop and I thought I could start doing that again I could start publishing again and Broken Sleep took off from there. own writing is there a separation between the writer and the publisher mindset when you sit down to write these days I think I'm more aware as a writer of um, typesetting so what the work is going to look like on the page what a potential publisher is going to see it like on the page whereas before I would just write and that I never considered what it would look like in the book form whereas now I'm thinking about that from the moment I write um, but it is, it's, it's odd to have the publisher and the writing side working together because I spend so much time working on other people's work, editing other people's work, making it as great as possible for them that sometimes I find I do forget to put that energy into my own work because I've expanded so much energy on promotion that when it comes to me, it, I'm, I'm out. So, it's got so much positive and I wouldn't change it for the world. I love publishing, but I do find I've got to, I don't know how to juggle working on my own stuff alongside helping others yet. I'm putting too much into helping others and neglecting my own work sometimes. As Broken Sleep is growing, are you kind of getting better at that? Yeah, I've, I've improved um, because, well, it's since I, I've stopped working as a teacher, so I was a teacher and a housemaster as well. Um, and then I had a, a brain hemorrhage and I nearly died. I spent six weeks in the hospital. And then when I came out, it was obvious I wasn't gonna go back to teaching. So I, Broken Sleep is my full-time job, which means instead of teaching all day, finding small hours and small pockets of time to get Broken Sleep done during the day and at night, and then having nothing left for myself because I also have two young children, I now am just doing Broken Sleep during the day and able to write in the evenings and stuff like that. So now, because I've dropped one of those sort of commitments, I now can find a bit more time to put into my own writing, yeah. I haven't actually kind of fielded this as a question within what I said, but uh, if I may ask, how did that brain hemorrhage, you know, if it had an impact on your writing at all? Yeah, it's had a massive impact. So first of all, I found, even if I was writing anything that had nothing to do with the hemorrhage, it would it would pop up, it would be there. Um, even if it didn't explicitly stay that, I knew that that was the metaphor, that was the symbology, that's what it was dealing with. Um, and so I solved the insomnia kind of a month before the hemorrhage and I was sleeping okay and then the hemorrhage has left me with a scar on my right temporal lobe which um, causes some visual issues and the insomnia is back so I take melatonin every night to try and sleep to give me some sleep because otherwise I can't really get any so I get three or four hours a night for melatonin but the moment the melatonin hits in the moment it kicks in and I start to sleep I start to write a poem that is my practice at the moment and I wake up in the morning and I read back what I've written and it's typos, random letters that make no sense and random subconscious thoughts, like one of them mentioned Craig David and a birthday cake. Um, and that's, I'm left with that and then I edit it consciously over the next few days or I spend two weeks every night writing just the same on the same sheet and then edit that over the next few days. So it's the conscious editing the subconscious which comes into play with the whole the hemorrhage, something happening in your brain without you being aware of it and how you deal with it once you become aware of it. My poetry's kind of intermingling those ideas. So I'm playing with making my brain work subconsciously and then making it work consciously as a sort of response to the hemorrhage. I note in your writing that you are very open about your history of personal struggles as well as celebrations of the people who make you happy. Both form subtle work backdrops in a number of poems from the collected pamphlets. Could you tell me a little bit more about your inspirations as a poet? 
Yeah, it's. I find I did a workshop at the school I was teaching at before the hemorrhage. I did a workshop there earlier this month. I went back and did a National Poetry Day workshop. And I said to the students, um, who likes poetry? And no hands went up. They were year eights, no hands went up. And I said, okay, who likes music? And they all put their hands up. And they were like, of course, who doesn't like music? And I said, well, it's the same with poetry. I didn't, I, you've lumped poetry into one big thing, but there's loads of different genres and types. It's the same with music. If I asked you to put your hand up for jazz now, I'd like barely any of you, I imagine, will put your hands up. It's the same with poetry. And that's because I think when it comes to poetry, it's not just being inspired by poetry. There's loads of different influences. So being a father changed my poetry. Having a brain hemorrhage changed my poetry. Um, being a father for the second time changed that. Leaving Cornwall, my home county, and coming to Wales. Having been a submariner in the military adds a dimension to my poetry. Um, but so those are all those are all personal influences. But there's also influences like poetic influences. Like I really like J.H. Prynne's work, and I really like Andrew McMillan's work. But they're very, very far apart. And I love like Benjamin Safanier and Gillian Clark, and they're very far apart. But that's because I think if you like say Jeremy Prynne's work and you want to write poetry like Jeremy Prynne and you try to write poetry like Jeremy Prynne you're going to write something that's completely uninspired but if you want to write a poem like Jeremy Prynne using the styles and methods of Benjamin Zephania with the ideas all your own then you're going to come up with something fascinating and real and even to the extent that if I'm writing a poem I'm not just bringing you know fatherhood or uh, Andrew McMillan and Gillian Clark or Zephania to the table I'm also bringing uh, Kanye West, like I'm bringing Donda, which is an album I'm admiring a lot at the moment, or uh, Kendrick Lamar, or Frightened Rabbit. There's there's MF Doom. There's so much more than just uh, literary influence, and that's I, I I enjoy writing in a way that brings in every possible influence. I read novels all the time. Um, I apart from the month in the hospital after the stroke where I had double vision for a month I, there hasn't been a single night where I haven't read a novel and that comes into it as well so there's just there's a whole array of everything So it seems like a very wide range of influences Yeah and I find that I find my poetry changes and moves from a stage in my life in, star, in genre as well as form I'm not writing the same genre of poem or the form or style because my influences are shifting. I remember I read about 10 years ago that when you hit 32, you stop discovering new music and your, your tastes become kind of concrete because you just, you don't discover new music. So my aim this year was to discover, keep discovering new music. And that's happened. I've discovered new bands and new artists. And through that, that's changed the way I think. And all my tastes like, uh, my I did a master's in film and television. I was a screenwriter for a short while and that's changed because I'm still discovering different films and I want to keep evolving my tastes so that I keep evolving my poetry. As a champion um, of the intersection of the marginalised and boldly experimental voices, you're doing some wonderful things as a writer and publisher. In your opinion, what are the principal barriers faced by poets from marginalised backgrounds? i found recently that a lot of the more lauded publishing houses run a sort of gentrified system in that like, there's a lot of, oh, uh, we've printed on paper that was found left over in Emily Dickinson's typewriter in the corner of a room with gold leaf inserts and gold printed outside with a case bound faux leather jacket and all this sort of stuff and it looks beautiful but it it skyrockets the cost and if you're working class or if you're a marginalized voice or you can't traditionally can't afford that sort of stuff so it's really easy to overcome that so you can offer ebooks for much less, and you can offer We uh, Broken Sleep. I've always made it a thing that if anyone wants a PDF of a book, they can email, and we will send them the PDF for free without paying a penny. Because the more people you give access to literature, the more people will indulge in literature, whether as an act or as active or passively. And that's kind of what we want. So I think skyrocketing costs without concerns for accessibility lead to 
just completely cutting off massive amounts of audience and saying I'm only interested in middle and upper class people buying this and therefore I'm only interested in the work produced off the back of this because great art is collaboration when someone else makes something that's fantastic I don't sit there and go oh I'm so jealous of them I'm so angry at them for getting that success or whatever I think that's amazing how can I adapt and become better through this how can I work with them to become a better poet or a better writer and you can't do that if you've not got access to art so I think for marginalised voices the lack of access is the issue and there's so many easy ways to overcome that and I I want to see more presses do things like offer PDFs and I offer free physical books every month to low and low income individuals who need them etc and I, I think that's if I can do that and I'm mostly just me running a press by myself with not the income of say Penguin or something like that and many many publishers can do that. writers to have influenced you although I think you probably touched a little bit um, yeah. on this already so are there any any others who you may not have mentioned um, I really admire I like Wayne Holloway Smith a lot um, he does a lot of great community stuff as well a lot of great helping out people and Love Minus Love is a fantastic collection um, Vani Capodeo they're, they're absolutely incredible and they're every book they release is is without even having read it you know it's gonna be in the running for poetry book of the year it's absolutely sensational work time and time again um mts darker's absolutely sensational um and i'm a big fan of this he passed away many years ago a hungarian poet called Silia bobelli um and I've even referenced a line of his in work that I've produced uh, about leaving a message for himself on the answer phone. And there's a, so much great translation out there, so much great work being written in translation um, that I think people get sucked into just taking the influences from their own language. But there's, there's so much brilliance in translation that that's, that's a field I'm really exploring. There's a book called uh, poems from the Age of Extinction by Chris McCabe, edited by Chris McCabe, and it's just poems written in languages that are going extinct. So Welsh is in there and Cornish is in there, but it's a massive array of languages. And the way other languages are writing, because their culture dictates their language, their culture dictates how they write, what they write about, etc. If you read that and change that and think about how your culture specifies your own language, you can become something so much more unique and different and that's that's what I'm going for at the moment as well. And um, lastly, are you working on anything present? Any writing projects or publication projects? Yeah, I'm working on my next collection after Angels of Size of Houses. It's called Circadian Rhythm Fashion Week. Um, and that's the sleep poems, like circadian rhythm, etc. That's the poems I'm writing when I'm sleeping and editing after. Um, and there's about 60 odd of those so far. That's, I'm really enjoying that. That's quite a fun experience. I'm working on a short story collection. Um, both of these are with my agent, and she's uh, going to start looking for places when they're in a good position. Um, publishing wise, we're, I'm already typesetting and designing um, April, May, and June 2022's books. So I like to be, now that it's full time, I like to be really ahead of it, give myself lots of time. And then um, this month, uh, October, we've got like Luke Kennard, Morag Smith coming out, um, Gregory Ledbetter and Hannah Copley's Speculum, which is a sensational debut collection that I'm so proud to publish. And then I've spent a lot of time recently working on the 2021 anthology, which is out in December. So they'll be up for pre-order soon-ish and that's about 450 odd pages and contains a wonderful selection yeah exactly yeah you've seen it and it's just five poems or pages from everything we've published this year and it's always an exciting thing to do that because you get to reread all this work and i'm finding ways and trying to maintain ways to remind authors even two years ago three years ago when we started the press that i'm still pushing their work and i'm still promoting their work and i'm still like giving their work the credence it deserves so we're doing I'm looking at ways to 
keep promoting work even though it's three years four years ago and I don't want authors to think well I released two years down the line that's it I want to maintain yes. that relationship well thank you very much Aaron thank you thank you for your time thank you very much